So the next part that I was just about to talk about, I say let's go a little further if we can by looking at the looker directly instead of assuming things or allowing certain things to remain invisible. Now I want to add something else. We added that there's a relationship between certainty and uncertainty. Right? Okay. We added that there's a relationship, then we added our own dislike and in an effort to start looking at everything directly with its energy intact. We're trying to look at everything with its energy intact. When we manipulate, we're trying to manipulate energy levels from higher to lower. It's what we're really doing. We're trying to tamp down the raw, vital, direct energy of reality. Okay. So, can we now look at the looker? What is the looker doing? What is the perceiver doing? We have to add that. Once we start trying to untie this package, things get very exciting and very confusing. They get confusing because we are now modulating or melting the whole sense of who is a person and what a person is. Okay? Usually when we determine something is uncertain, just listen for a bit, just to see how deep this goes. When we determine something is uncertain, whether it's external, like a feature of the world, or something that's internal, our own feelings, we believe we are seeing these things from an objective standpoint. Mm -hmm. Uncertainness is over here. I'm certain. It's, a, it's, it's objectively true. Or I'm uncertain about what you think about me. I think that you know, you, you may, you, I don't know what you think. I'm certain. I'm objective. I, I'm seeing objective reality. There's an there's a, a immediate, you see this? It's like hidden self. This is true even when we talk about our subjective self. We say, I feel such and such. That's objectively true. <laughs> I feel such and such. It seems to be an objective fact about the world. We like to deal in facts and to hell with whether they're actually true. <laughs> we deal in facts. Even if we change our mind and have new insight by some revelation, we're now objectively true. We're objectively sure that that's what we're feeling. We deal in this very odd, if we really look at it, this very odd way of looking at the world as if it were objective. Now, what we're forgetting <laughs> is that, I'm just going to, I'll go back to my notes in a minute, but what, what we're forgetting is that that whole schema is made by the ego. This psychic part of ourselves that has determined that there is a demarcation in the world where things are personal or not personal. They're subjective or objective. And we look out of our egoic eyes, from here in is subjective, and from here out is subjective. So, the ego machinery is personal because it creates the personal and sees the world in its own image. In other words, without taking its own contribution into account. Okay? Everybody get that? It, it's a coloration. It's a coloration of everything. It's like a radio receiver thinking that there's an objective thing called a radio show. But that's a radio show. <laughs> when there's no radio show, because the radio is part of it. There may be some actors doing some stuff in front of some machinery, but there's no radio show without the radio receiver. If the radio thinks that it is separate from the radio show, it's time for a commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, to deny that there is a, such a thing as personal and such a thing as not personal, there's something subjective and something objective would be crazy. That would be crazy. And I, what I wrote here is, Someone slaps us and we feel it. 
people down the road don't feel it, at least right away. Because <laughs> eventually they'll feel it. And yet, this personal ego that has divided the world into the subjective objective view is not personal. The whole ego is a creature of great impersonal forces. The ego is not personal. It is created. You didn't personally create your ego. You may have modified it. You may have clothed it. You may have decorated it for Halloween. <laughs> but you did not create it. See here, I have a little exercise for us. Ready for this? Yeah. Okay. Here you are. Actually, we do this. Okay. So you just you just this thing. You're just this consciousness, right? You're just this consciousness. You're this sitting there in your body, just consciousness. And I have this new pill made by Procter and Gamble. <laughs> which you're going to take it in your hand. Every take a pill in your hand. Thank you. This is called the ego pill. And you're going to swallow it. And when you swallow it, it suddenly gives you a feeling of personalness. Now you look out of your eyes, and you have a personal sense. You didn't have that before you took the pill. Right? The only thing is, you didn't make that pill. She won't take the pill. She won't take the pill. <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm thinking. You can't think. You're just a consciousness. Oh. Do you want to think? You have to take the pill. <laughs> so now you have this personal sense, but you didn't create the pill. This was manufactured by Procter & Gamble. <laughs> I have to go, I have to start buying stock in Procter & Gamble. <laughs> I should have said like Merck or something. <laughs> That's what the ego is like. It gives you this tremendous personal self, which is both real and unreal simultaneously. To be able to understand this, this lecture, to be able to understand this aspect of non-duality, you exist at first until you can become practiced at it in a kind of mist, in a kind of mist, <laughs> <laughs> until it becomes really, really very uh, seated and solid and misty at the same time. So you now have this ego sense of being a person and so on. You do all of this stuff. But that pill was created by great impersonal forces that did not belong to you until you swallowed it. Then it belonged to you. But part of the pill's function was to make you sense that there was a you that things can belong to. You get this? It made a you, and now you have objective and subjective thoughts and things belong to you and don't belong to you and so on. And that's good because you need to be a person. And it's also not the entire truth. It's part of the truth, but it's not the entire truth. The entire truth is that this ego is an eddy in the river. You are not the river, but you are part of the river. And you are also the river, but you're also a separate feature of the river. Everything's about that pill that you take. But you have to have the receiver part in yourself. Otherwise, you can swallow the whole piece of them and it can change. So it, we start from the point where this consciousness, there is something in this consciousness that is receiver. It's, so it's, it's in us already, although ego is not created. It's this you know, force. 
but it's something in us already that matches with this. Quality. Yes, the, the so reason. The, the, <coughs> the third thing that is yeah. personal. Yeah, we're trying to tease apart things that are simultaneous and actually inseparable. So in talking about it, we invent something called causality. And causality doesn't actually work in, in, in this completely non-dual world. So that's what you're picking up on. You're right. So what I wrote here, at some point, in our spiritual journey, we realize that the ego is this amazing interplay between the great impersonal forces that make the ego and the product of these forces, which is a sense of being a separate being. Should I repeat that sentence? Yes. yes. At some point in our spiritual journey, now, we realize that the ego is this amazing interplay between the great impersonal forces that make the ego, the river of being, and the product of these forces, which is a sense of being a separate being. They're happening simultaneously in constant interplay, the personal and the impersonal. They're happening at the same time. Now we're talking about relationships. We're not talking about this or that, all of which is in the realm of the ego's <coughs> belief. All of which is in the realm of the ego's belief. Yes, sir. So you had said the sense of being a separate being, but the reality is we are also separate beings, right? It's not just a sense. You only know it by senses, actually. Mm. It's because you have a sensorium that you could consider yourself a separate being. If you had no sensorium and were in a vegetative state, you would not know you were a separate being. So I'm using sense in that large sense. Remember, we're talking about uncertainty and certainty and everything that it brings in because they are the exemplars. They are the emblems of the motto of this universe. These two opposites. Uh, that's, I actually say it here. That's good. In the, case, <laughs> in the case of the main thing we're discussing today, certainty and uncertainty, can be seen correctly, I believe, as features of the world which cannot be pulled apart. They are mutually co-arising. Let's dare to say, in this discussion, since we're going very far, that there is no certainty. There is no uncertainty. There is only both of them. Because we are egoic beings whose evolutionary imperative is to sustain our personal survival and the survival of the species, we focus on one of them. However, when things get out of whack, as they are in the world today, and personal survival becomes distorted and the only thing that is important, then it's not even personal survival that we're really talking about. We're talking about some pathological think, we need to correct it with the actual underlying non-dual view of what reality is. That we are both personal and not personal at the same time. Nobody here made themselves. Your parents didn't do it. They just acted as a conduit. To stop splitting the world, to stop splitting certainty and uncertainty is one of the deepest feelings you can have. Now, I don't know if you can feel it yet. But when you can hold both of those things simultaneously, what are you holding? 
let's use words that are not jargon, because not everybody knows these words, and, and let's see, let's stretch ourselves and not use our shorthand. Say it again, the beginning. When we are, when we can hold certainty and uncertainty simultaneously, what are we holding? Life. Life. Reality. But can you feel it? Can you feel it? Try it. It feels like a split second of, of reality being revealed. It's like a fragrance to me. Yeah. It's not a thing. It's a fragrance. And it feels like, um, it, the word I want to use is, it's such a paradigm shift, even from the point of view of our spiritual development. Um, because we, it, all I can say is it's momentary, but I can imagine the possibility of developing um, some kind of contact that begins to be somewhat familiar, even if it's familiar in the way in which it, um, the way in which it can jolt this notion of this idea that we often have of a fixed. Um, permanent reality. So it, it's not just the word everything is impermanent. It's this, it's this wake up moment. So it feels like a, feels like a revelation. Yes. Yes. Uh, and do, for me, when you uh, do the magi and you set up, you isolate. So you're isolating, let's say, uncertainty, and it's uncomfortable and you want to overcome it. It's a dualistic place. For me, that what I discovered using the Magi is that what evolves is um, pure beingness. Either blending in pure beingness, presence. It's not uh, a state or a thing or a concept. It's non dualistic, it's wholeness. It's not me trying to overcome something else. It's what I already am. It, what it is, it's beings. So that's the that's the word I use to describe this feeling. It's the catch is that since I have this ego presence, is to then say, "Wow, I can use that." You know what I'm saying? And then you separate and. Uh, so it's a delicate... No. It's actually more robust than that. Your tendency, when I say your, I mean our tendency, will be, as beings who have an ego, to want to make functional use of all of these things. We don't need to be pure anything. When people need to be pure something, we get Boko Haram. I'm serious about this. We get fundamentalism. What we're trying to promote here is the understanding of, I agree with much of what you said. I'm just fine tuning some stuff here. Oh, okay. Just yeah, yeah. You didn't agree with it. <laughs> the word pure. Pure, oh, I mean, yeah. pure being. You know, it's, it, you have to be careful of that. Okay. Wholeness was a better word for oh, me. Yeah, I was trying to avoid, you said used it, yeah. And also, you didn't succumb completely. You were trying to succumb, but you didn't succumb to the nameless quality of this. Because you were trying to name it, because people name stuff. <laughs> that's, that's what you said, but yeah. it, it's not. That's why I say it's not a. a, 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 a thing. It wasn't a name of the whole thing, right? You're right. I mean, yeah, but I, I get you. I, I felt. I, I knew you felt it. Yeah. yeah. yeah I just was. <laughs> I just need you. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Alice, um, there's just uh, a freedom to it, maybe a spaciousness. There's less fettering. Uh, I mean, I just, I don't know. But it can touch that place, maybe. But, but it's not all the time. I don't know if that's... that's I'll sit down. I'm going to sit down. It's okay. Um, I found a, a, just the still point. Just a fleeting still point. All of these, all of these comments are great. All of these comments are great. Candy? 
I, I felt uh, a sense of relief and roundness and um, very emotional, poignant feeling of my whole sensorium that was very poignant and I, I, it felt like love. <laughs> I'm going to talk about love in a minute. <laughs> Tara? The first in an intense fatigue. Fatigue? The first. In Are you reading it? <laughs> responses. Breaking habitual responses is called awakening. In case you want to know what it is. It's an awakening process of breaking habitual responses because habitual responses become invisible. And we need them, as Terry said before, for walking. The child moves one foot forward and falls because walking is about falling forward. So we need to memorize that so we can walk, right? We need to memorize that because we don't want to be going every time we walk. We don't want to go, whoa, whoa. We don't want to be doing that. Sometimes I do that. But we don't want to be doing that in general. We want to mechanicalize that. We want to institutionalize that. We want to remember it. Yeah. Although Experiencing what you were describing, that's what it felt like. It felt like, whoa! So it's exactly what it felt like. Right, <laughs> right. But so much. my experience, my experience of that is that everything becomes holy. And sometimes it gets too holy, I admit. But a lot of the time, it's looking at everything being holy. Not because it's all special but because it's all holy. It's just a fact. It's not some sort of special thing. Are you certain? Hmm? Are you certain? I'm completely certain. <laughs> but I'm certain... <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> what? <laughs> she said some people need a break. Yes. But I only have ten minutes more. <laughs> what? It was good thinking. It's, it's it's something I I never think about, and I have to be reminded all the time. So I appreciate the. Uh, do you have to go? <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm, I'm going to sit down again. I'll race through the last part. <laughs> number, number 79. I am certain I have to pay. Yeah, but it says here 11.30 is the break. I'm just going to go on, okay? Yeah, but I know it's not a little If you have to go, go. Thank you. That was time. Where'd that come from? Oh, is that me? <laughs> <It's> yeah. <laughs> it's going away. Thank you. To feel this and stop splitting certainty and uncertainty is a healing on the deepest level. Rather than trying to define uncertainty or make a set of rules or structures for seeing its worth, we can allow certainty to enter into our seeking process, uncertainty, and being with reality just as it is. Can you read that slowly? No, no, that's not important. <laughs> In this way, we illuminate how certainty and uncertainty are braided throughout thinking and feeling. In fact, 
to every micro and macro moment there is. Okay, we got this already. We talked about this part. Certainty and uncertainty support each other and arising together create each other and the entire world and ourselves as well. In this way, certainty and uncertainty are no longer events or things, but more like the waves the world is made of. So that's what you were trying to get out. And that's what, what the fragrance that Stephanie was, was talking about. They're no longer events or things. In the way we're looking at this, no longer, it's this is certain, that's uncertain. When we hold them together, we can feel this wave through the entire world and that everything is made of it. Every single thing is made of it. Those leaves on those trees outside there depend upon their creation. Their creation depends upon, and their life and their continuing life depends upon certainty and uncertainty at exactly the same time. Sometimes it works out better, sometimes it works out worse. That's a fact. But it depends upon those things. Water moves up the capillaries of that tree by a mixture of certainty and uncertainty. Randomness and order. Our thinking and feeling is based on that as well. I have a final step. Yes? I have a question for you. Um, I'm you glad. Is it <laughs> not here? Um, <laughs> so, um, there's a statement in the Magi process that says, don't get ready for information only. Also get ready for what information is made of. This is it. I mean, for me, it was the most puzzling statement that I've been holding. And you're just simply giving a whole expose on it. For me. For I me. agree. I yeah. agree. Yeah. For me, the whole whole magic process is yeah. is, is, is but like. Do not make plans. Do not like but make. No, make the, don't let plans, plans make you. Make you. Yeah. So here's the last the last step. Okay. Here's the last step that I'll I'll move to. And can people hold out for another ten minutes? <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, last step. Human beings have a tendency to try to solve a problem by using its opposite. It works out pretty good sometimes. Really, it's allopathic medicine. It's, it's many things. There's nothing that we have to say is, is, is bad, like a priori, you know? So, we use certainty. This is a restatement of some stuff I said in the beginning. We use certainty to try to solve uncertainty. Right? When we do that, we're thinking of uncertainty as something to solve. You understand? Mm -hmm. We're thinking of it as something to solve. And we buy into, even deeper, we, 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 we buy into the concept of solving itself. Which is another thing that human beings need. We need to solve stuff. I can't reject anything here. But we should know that, we're, that solving is not necessarily the only or deepest aspect of the world. When we try to solve it, we miss the fact that, the, that when we think about the great mystery of uncertainty, that certainty is itself equally mysterious. As my wife is prone to say, any time during the day, you can hear, sometimes hear this from another room, what? <laughs> what? Because <laughs> she's thinking about life and she goes, what? <laughs> uncertainty, the great mystery of uncertainty, the unknown. Certainty? What? That there's something here? that there's something that maintains its shape. This is a mystery also of equal, it must be equal, to uncertainties 
mystery. I watched a wonderful film the other day that I had never watched. It was immensely great. It was Charlie Chaplin's Limelight. Mm -hmm. If you've never seen this film, it's a unique film, what he does. This man, I think, was astounding. In, in this film, Charlie Chaplin's character says to a young, suffering woman who's looking for the meaning of life, he says, why look for meaning? Life is about design, the ongoing design of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the whole film is philosophical. Yeah, it's a beautiful film. The ongoing design of everything. So when we only had one mystery, which was uncertainty, we really have the possibility of two if we allow that other mystery to shine through. And when we have two, we have the possibility of relating to this braided, mutually colorizing condition in a new and direct way. Certainty and uncertainty together, both mysteries, both mysteries. Let's not think of certainty as not a shining thing. Do you get this? Do you feel this? When we have only one mystery, we have a tendency to solve it. When we have two mysteries, we become aligned with the creative forces of the universe. Mm. That's what's happening. When you hold uncertainty and certainty together, you come into alignment with the creative force of the universe. That's what people are trying to describe. That fragrance, that moment, that, that beingness, that wholeness, those leaves, that tree, you become the brother and sister of that tree. You become its protector and lover and maze, amazer and whatever we want to call it. Do you feel this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Form anxiety and form yeah. Simultaneous. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, only when we have one mystery we have something to solve. When we have two mysteries, we're aligned with the creative force itself and reveal and are revealed as part of that creative source itself. Oh, I wrote a little exercise here the other day. Oh, we did it. Here's a passage that I wanted Candy to hear. Every artist and every every artist <laughs> as my mouth has grown slack with age, my Brooklyn roots have come. Every artist is <laughs> every artist in any discipline, from physics to painting, will tell you that the act of creation is both certain and uncertain at exactly the same time. Artists know what they want to do and do not know it at the same time. Right, Paul? Yep. They are ready for the arrival for the guest who always comes, invited or uninvited, <laughs> never knowing how he or she will behave or how the evening's entertainment will turn out. <laughs> That's art. That's art. I don't care if it was Shakespeare or de Kooning or any great art. That's what an artist has to deal with if they're really in the world of art. So I have to ask you to take a moment and feel this. How does it feel to look at uncertainty, certainty's partner, and their relationship as the creative force. Now that we know what that is, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the force that is not only made the world, that's still somewhat dualistic. It's the force that is the world. Because quite frankly, those trees over there are moving and dancing. There's nothing still about that tree. To even call it a tree is to somewhat mistreat it. How do you spell that? With a T-R-E? 
<laughs> it's somehow to, to, to misunderstand it. Because that tree is in constant motion. There's nothing in that tree from microsecond to microsecond that is actually remaining the same. Decay is taking part in that tree. Growth is taking place in that tree. Water is moving. Chlorophyll molecules are moving. ATP is moving. All kinds of energy constructs are moving. Wind is moving it on the outside, etc., etc. Light is hitting it. This world is the function of creativity. And that's what we are here, too. We forget and sometimes think that we have territory to defend. Sometimes we do. You can't give up either side. Sometimes we do. But not always. And it's because we forget that we have no territory to defend that some people who forgot it want to invade or hurt other people. You understand? Mm -hmm. Even there, the root cause was that this was forgotten. Our entire reality is braided in this way. This braiding is kind of mutual dependence that every created thing has on its opposite. For those of you who know impersonal movement, you know what I'm talking about. From a non-dual perspective, our egos are personal and impersonal at the same time. Certainty and uncertainty are a single unit of creative force, which when we hold them together and are observed together and taken as a single thing, then we uh, reveal this creative force. We can look at uncertainty from a different perspective. Strangely and magnificently, when we hold reality in this way, instead of getting a sort of nameless mush, each thing becomes itself. I talked about that misty aspect before. That's a transitional space of learning to be in this where the ego gets very afraid to be spatially inconsistent and spatially out. That's a, that's a transitional moment. It could last for a long time, but it's a transitional space. Because when you really can hold these two things together, everything comes into focus as itself and as part of the whole simultaneously. Each one of those leaves feels like a being. Each one of you feel like a being. Oh, here's what I wrote. Strangely and magnificently, when we hold reality this way, we become ourselves, each tree and stream as well. Wisdom arises from this sort of consciousness, which knows the nameless thing that each named thing, like you and me, holds. Each named thing holds the nameless thing. The world then becomes a glowing place. Now, from this perspective, there's room for fear. Fear of uncertainty. How could we not be afraid? At least a little bit. How could we not be afraid? And our ability and courage to meet each moment is there as well. Our ability to do this is increased as our consciousness no longer splits reality into parts, but sees the need for creation in every piece of creation. So I have a final exercise for us. Usually when we, <laughs> I hope it's an even amount of people here, we'll see. Of course some will say. Usually we think we know somebody, but really we know more about the certain parts and little about what is uncertain. So looking at my wife, I write, which is my delight. <coughs> Hello, baby. 
<laughs> is even more delightful when I allow this person, who I know better than anyone in the world, to also remain uncertain, which is to say, a mystery to me. Right? From this point of view, uncertainty, the hidden and unknown parts, are not an adversary that I have to bring into knowing them. They're not an adversary, but held simultaneously with the certainties that I know are the light of creation and the light itself. Were you looking at that clock for some reason? Are you doing something wrong? No? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? She's just thinking about people. She's thinking about people. That's a problem. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's do this, do the exercise. 